Hey guys, Henning and MJ from flipnormals.com. In this video, we are gonna cover presentation and pricing for your products. This is the fourth part of our four part series covering basically how to make really nice tutorials and products which you can sell on the Flip Normals marketplace or any other place you want to sell. Presentation is insanely important for your product. And it's one of the things that people tend to skip out on. They often spend a significant amount of time making the tutorial itself or the brush pack or whatever it is you're using. And then when it comes to the actual presentation, the actual product page and the thumbnails, they tend to just kind of do some quick screenshots, mock up some quick text, do the whole thing in about half an hour and then shoot it off. And that's not good. <laughs> The more time and effort you spend on present presenting your work, the more your products would sell and the easier it is for customers to get a feel of what your product is like and really explore the product a bit, little bit before they actually buy it. And the first thing that I'm always taken back by when we see some products being presented, especially on Flip Normals, is it's always the thumbnail. Like the thumbnail is the first thing that the customer sees. It's the first thing that we see when we browse the marketplace for products as well. And it's a shame because oftentimes you see high quality products, whether it be tutorials, base meshes, brush packs, whatever, that they sort of forget the whole presentation thing. So they just take a screenshot of a, something from their product, use that as the thumbnail, and then they, they call it done. But it's really important to think about the whole flow of what a customer sees. When a customer arrives at a marketplace, there's typically a lot of products, right? So if you go to Flip Normals, you might see 40 products at a time. And, and picking out your specific product amongst that bunch, you have to think about how do I make it visually striking and appealing? How do I make my thumbnail actually stand out? And... It, it For us, at least, it starts very early on. You know, we try to plan things out and figure out what can we do thumbnail-wise to actually make it look good. And so you want to find some really impressive images from your products. Uh, if, you're, if you have a tutorial on how to create characters, for example, try to pick something from there, do a bespoke render, something that you know will work really well close up because... The important thing you have to keep in mind with thumbnails is that they're typically small, right? They're thumbnails. So you have to find something for a thumbnail that usually it wouldn't work for a gallery image and the other way around because you have something that's really small on screen, but it still, way, it still has to capture the attention of the customer. Um, something that we've done is we created this thumbnail template and our thumbnail template is kind of what we use to market our products as well. Uh, some of our creators use it as well, and, and we use it every single day when when we're creating new products. Yeah, the thermal template has the font all ready to set up for you. It has a bit of like, there's a bit less guesswork involved as well with that. Relating to actually making the thumbnail, we just do this all in Photoshop. Probably one of the biggest things we see is, at least a pretty big one, is people aren't grading the work. Like this is true for gallery images as well. They just might take their their actual renders and just slap them in a gallery. But for thumbnails as well, it's so important to get the gallery right or to get the thumbnail right. So once your thumbnail is somehow done in terms of the composition, you probably need to add a little bit of saturation, a little bit of contrast and just, just balance it out. Relating to this, you also have to test out the, the actual thumbnail. Like try out a few different ones, see what works. It's really easy to to like fall in love with one specific one, but then you can't actually read what's going on. Like the image might be too small or something. So actually taking like a screenshot off the marketplace or like off flipnormals.com and then Photoshopping your thumbnail into it might be really helpful because this is how, this is what it's gonna look like. Or what you can do, you can publish the product with your current, current thumbnail, actually see the product on the marketplace. And then you can just change it, just replace it and see what works best. Like we can't stress how important it is to have a good thumbnail. The thumbnail is the thing that's going to make people click on your product. It's like having a nice label in an actual store. Like if you're selling ketchup, you need like a nice label for it. Otherwise, people generally won't see your uh, your your product and they're just not going to buy it. Think about it like you have a 
you have a grocery store, you have two grocery stores right next to each other. One is really nice and well presented, like all their groceries are stocked, fruits, vegetables, it all looks nice. The other one looks run down, the facade is just ruined. They both sell the same products on the inside, but what the customer sees, you know, that sort of determines which one they're going to pick. I think another important one there is when it, when it has to do with text and logos. Like text can really be, text should mainly be for your title and description. There can be a little bit of text on your thumbnail, which is fine, which adds a little more information that you want to sort of con convey to your potential customers, but it shouldn't be the main focus. And the same thing goes with logos. You can have something Maybe if it's a, it's predominantly a ZBrush tutorial, have a little logo of, of ZBrush up in the corner, but it shouldn't be, again, the main focus of this. This, of course, varies if you're selling more of a utility type of product, um, but for the majority of products that are visual, tutorials, base meshes, brush packs, uh, reference packs, whatever it may be, these, these things are good to keep in mind in general. And one of the more important things is pricing. We have to just spend a fair bit of time on pricing because that is one of the <laughs> hardest things to do figure out whenever you're doing a, your own product it's one of these topics that's it's easy but not simple like you it, at the end of the day you just have to input some numbers but finding those numbers is really tricky it boils down to a few different things the first one is what is your product like how good is your actual product if it's not just about oh your product should be 40 or 50 dollars well it depends what are you selling if the product is just a simple uh, base mesh that took you like two days to do and it doesn't really have a lot of features you you can't price that in the same way as like a fully production ready base mesh that has really nice topology multiple uv sets works for all sorts of characters uh, it, it really just depends on what you're selling. What we do for our products is we have fully narrated courses. The courses are often like 10 hours plus. We are really spending time on the editing. So the video files are really clean and you know what you're getting in general. And we're usually going between like the 40 and to the $60, $70 price mark for our courses. But it depends entirely on what you're doing. If you have then a two hour course that is not narrated and the video editing is isn't really done properly or it isn't edited at all you probably won't be able to price it at the same price as what we are doing with the, our products but it really depends on the actual quality of your product you also have to think about how is your product unique like how is it different from other pro other products as well if you if there is a big market for let's say like uh, we saw this a few years ago like reference packs and somebody came up with really high quality reference packs and there is nothing else out there you can price your product quite high but if you're doing reference packs and the market is insanely saturated with that you probably can't do that just purely like supply and demand if there are a lot of reference packs around like $15 and you have a very similar product and yours is 40 they're just not going to pick your product so then you're forced to like lower the price to to even be competitive and something that can be quite tricky nowadays i think is a lot of people expect a lot of products to be either free or very cheap you know i think this all came about with the app store era where all of a sudden you could f get like almost full-fledged applications or games for like one or two bucks and <laughs> that sort of propagated to to everything i remember seeing that when we started out with tutorials a lot of artists were selling their stuff on something like gumroad for just a couple dollars Maybe you had a 20 hour tutorial fully narrated on how to do concept painting or whatever, but it's just two bucks and someone might've spent 50 hours creating that course. That was something that in the beginning for us, we were like, well, we, we think we should get paid for our time and the type of effort we put in and the type of quality that we want to create. And I think that extends to, to everyone. Of course, you're free to price your product however you like, but I think one of the things that's important to keep is try to remove your ego uh, from the whole equation. And and because I think oftentimes that actually leads to lower, lower price products. People are sort of in doubt of their skill sets. They're in doubt of how good their product is or what they're selling. So oftentimes they'll just price it low. If you price it low, people might have lower expectations. They're like, okay, it just cost a dollar to buy this 20 hour tutorial. Not a big deal. 
compared to if you sell it for $60, for example. Now, people might have higher expectations, but also if you can deliver on those expectations, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There is also a chance that they're going to complete your tutorial or use your product more as well. I, I see this all the time, like on, on PlayStation, I might buy a game for $60 and there might be a comparable one for like $10. And there might not actually be a big difference between the games, but I'm sure as hell going to play the $60 game a lot more. Because, you know, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I, I can't just like try it for like five minutes and see, I gotta properly give it a try. Another point as well, which is often not talk about if relating to low price product or really the pricing in general is... You have to do customer support. Like you really have to consider that if you're putting a product out into the wild, you need to provide customer support for it. So if you're providing a product for like, let's say it's $1 versus like $50, you you should in theory have 50 times as much support. You know, this doesn't scale and it's hard to get exact numbers on this. But the gist of it is if you do, a, let's say $5 versus a $50 product, you, you obviously need to sell a lot more. But with that, it comes a time sink called customer support. So just really keep that in mind. The more expensive your product is, the less customer support you're dealing with as well. There's like a weird thing as well when it comes to, to general customer support and kind of like the quality of the customers. We've seen this with like um, in the car industry, the people who buy cheaper cars tend to complain more than people who buy expensive cars, regardless of the actual issues of the car. And it's the same thing here as well. You often see this with people who buy expensive products and there some, might be something wrong with it. They're generally like quite strangely enough patient with it. But somebody who buys a $5 product, they're expecting that product to like do everything to solve every problem. Problem. So the customer support you get as why the, part, the customer support you, you, you get might as well also be a lot more annoying and vicious if your product is priced at a lower price point. Yeah, I mean, customers is a whole, it's a whole different beast, right? Providing support for the people who buy your products. I think it's also important to keep in mind that, you know, sometimes you just want to make your product available for a wider audience and pricing a product low will definitely do that. You know, if it's just a couple bucks for a fully fledged tutorial or a really nice base mesh, more products or more people can get access to it, which is definitely a strategy as well. There's there's definitely nothing wrong with that. One thing in the sort of the same vein when it comes to pricing that I think is important to talk about is the sort of psychology behind uh, vi like the visual aspect of pricing. Like we're all conditioned and we're exposed to the same type of pricing generally uh, around the world. There's There's been a lot of studies on the type of pricing that you do on products how it affects people and how it makes them more or less likely to buy a product and sort of the trend that we're following well i should really call it a trend because it's more of a psychological thing is if your product is priced under a hundred dollars for example uh it's good to keep sort of think about the decimals in in your products so if, let's say you want to sell a 40 dollar product a 40 dollar product might sell 10 copies, let's say. But if you price your product at $39.99, that might sell 12 copies, 13 copies, just a few more because of that little one cent difference. This is because a customer looks at your product that's $39.99 and doesn't perceive it as being $40, even though it's practically the same as the $40 product. They see it as being, well, it's a product that costs somewhere in the 30s. They look at the first the first number in that in that price, that's the one they they sort of put the most, uh, what do you call it, like focus on. And then they see the nine. Okay, so 39. They don't associate that with 40. If you bump it up by one cent, it becomes a lot more expensive psychology all of a, psychologically all of a sudden. And you can do that with a lot of different prices. 9.99. I mean, you've seen this in stores all the time. 12.99, uh, 12.49, whatever it may be. There's always like a little play around with those, those decimals to make it more appealing to customers. It's a, it's a sort of strange tactic, if you will, but it, it does help to create more conversions and it does help you sell more. It's also important to add a commercial license as well to all your products. Kind of two reasons for this. The first one is that if you don't have a commercial license, commercial companies won't really be able to buy your products. We see this a lot where, or when we're doing customer support, that we have studios and just general companies 
talk to us and request commercial licenses for products that don't have that. And we can't really add that because they might be creator products. But if they don't have a commercial license, they're not legally allowed to use them for commercial purposes. Like you can't have a studio buying a personal license and using that for commercial use, even if there isn't a commercial license. I mean, some of them might do that any anyway, but that's a bit of a different point. So always add a commercial license to it. And um, then the second point here is that your product is probably worth a lot more than you think in a commercial context. Let's take the, the Flip Normal skin kit. That took me about a month, probably about a month and a half to do. That's like full-time work. It's a very time-consuming thing to do. And now the company who buys it can buy it for like $40, right? And that means that's basically like an hour or two of a, of a studio worker's uh, salary. So obviously that's an insane gain, you know, instead of spending instead of spending like a month worth of salary creating that they can just buy it for a few bucks but this is where you want to capitalize on that like in this case you want to charge them more for that like the value they're getting for that like you should be compensated in part for that value so we tend to put the commercial price on set between like five to ten times of the personal license so if the uh, if the commercial license is like, or if the personal license is around twenty-five dollars, then you would do between like roughly like between like hundred to hundred dollars, you know, just to have a ballpark for that. But the point is, you definitely want to have like a multiplier of the original price. If the original one is ten dollars, you don't want the commercial to be like fifteen dollars. You definitely want to like increase it to quite a lot more for that. Simply because they're they're making money on. On this and the studios are also dealing with a completely different budget than what personal licenses holders are doing you know if you're a personal license holder or if you're buying that license you're probably going to be a student or somebody's trying to learn something and then your budget is significantly smaller than like a studio trying to actually do a job yeah and from a just from a practical point of view as well it's it's something that it took us a long time to actually do. We we had we had lower commercial prices for a long time actually, but when you think about it, if if a product costs uh, ten dollars and a commercial license is a hundred, you just need one sale of the commercial license to make up for ten uh, personal sales. But you also have to consider like what is a studio, what what kind of value do they gain from purchasing your product, and but and that kind of leads you to have to experiment with your prices as well, whether it be the personal or the commercial license prices. For a commercial license, for instance, when a company is doing, let's say they need a base mesh, like a full base mesh with UVs and everything. Let's say it takes them a week to create that for an artist. Okay, let's say that's $1,000 in studio hours, right? It will cost them $1,000 to create. You sell a commercial license for a base mesh for $200. Uh, it might almost fit their needs. Then it's going to be a no-brainer for them to buy it spend half a day to tweak it, to get the UV layout just right. And now they've maybe spent a total of $300 to, to get a fully ready, a full ready base mesh for their production. So that's a no brainer for the, the studios as well. So think about that when you're experimenting with prices, lower, higher, it's really, there's no set number that your product should be priced at. Just keep that in mind. Everything we're doing here are examples based on our own experiences as well, but it, it could be very different for the type of product that you sell. Then let's talk about this specific product pages. This is the page where you, the really the page where people will be buying a product from. This is where you have the gallery and you have a lot of text explaining what the product is. One of the most important things about this page is the gallery. This is where you need to include actual images of the product itself this is way more related to like more creative kind of products instead of like the technical ones like scripts and such but this is where you have screenshots of the tutorial if you're selling a tutorial it might be uh, final images of how your brush pack can be used and also very importantly you should probably have a trailer if possible now if you're doing a technical product like a script this is actually where a trailer or some kind of description works really well because now you can show exactly how it works if you're doing a, like a brush pack, that's a bit harder because, you know, it's not as intuitive to make a trailer for that. But what we would do when we have those kind of products is we record ourselves using the brush pack 
and for tutorials, that's the easiest one to make uh, to make a trailer for because you essentially make an edit of your whole course and you put that into a trailer and then you do like a nice easy voiceover explaining that. It's really important to make a trailer and also put the trailer first in the gallery so people can very easily access that. Particularly for tutorials, this is important because now they get to hear your voice. They get to see a little bit of your style as well. And it's just a huge part of actually selling your products to people. The product page is really where people are making the decision to buy or to not buy your product. So spend proper time on this page. One of the things that we tend to do for our products is we have a section we call contains. And it's just what it sounds like. It's everything that's contained in the tutorial, like what types of files. And this list is very helpful, especially because, you know, it's nice, it's readable, it's right there. It's accessible by Google. It can impact the SEO score, which makes it easier to find for Google. But it also gives customer an easy overview of what are, what are they actually buying. Um, on on Flip Normals in particular, we also have a file list over on the right in the sidebar. Uh, which shows, you know, just technically all the files. But the contains list is a manual thing that we create where you can also add more information about each file. So maybe you have a, a zip folder that's called, you know, chapters plus pure ref. And then you can talk about, okay, so it contains these chapters. And I've included three pure ref files for this and this chapter. And then speaking of, uh, of chapters, we also include a specific chapter list as well. It's pretty important for people, for people to get an overview over the actual uh, actual course. You know, this obviously only applies to courses where you just know how many files there are. We sometimes include the length as well. Often people often prefer like shorter videos. So if they, well, if they do prefer shorter videos, this is a good way for them to know what more of the, more of what they're actually buying. One of the more important things as well for the actual product page is going to be the text. This is also sometimes referred to just as copy. And the copy is incredibly important because this is how you're actually convincing people to buy the product. What we highly recommend is that the text is straight to the point where let's say you're writing the copy for something like the skin kit, which is just a set of alphas used for, for characters and creatures. Instead of writing that we started this based back in a day and writing a whole story of you just go like this is going to help you create realistic skin for characters in seconds instead of hours just go straight to the point and just keep it simple for our old product pages we used to really make extremely long like text <laughs> descriptions i would say we i mean yeah. me because that was what i was doing i would just like put out everything was nice about a product everything you would learn it was basically a whole article but what we're doing now is we're simplifying this drastically we're just putting down the most essential parts and then we're writing and rewriting this you can actually use assist tools for this as well like you can use tools like chat gpt for this i often use this tool for just like just input like rewrite and it just rewrites it in a nice way and um you just get a bit more like natural sounding language that way, particularly if English is not your first language. Or you can use tools like Grammarly as well. I use Grammarly for absolutely everything. If I write anything and it goes online in a flip normals context, like any kind of social media post or article, I like copy paste it into Grammarly and it just gives me like a whole list of things to fix. Then I just copy it, paste it back again as well. So every single product page on flip normals from the crack of dawn has gone through specific like Grammarly for that. Like, we just use the personal tier. Like this is not a sponsored video for Grammarly or anything. This is just a, a really helpful tool for that. So keep your text to the point and uh, really reduce the text. Probably you need to simplify the text. In nearly all cases, you will have too much text explaining it. And make it nice and readable. When it comes to text, it's one of the, the things I've really learned in the last few years is it's not just how, what it says is how it looks like the whole formatting of it if you have text which is absolutely brilliant it will explain how the product works and convince you but it's just a wall of text you are not going to be convinced of that so like for instance for the um the flipmos skin kit we we actually cut away a lot of text we used to have like a lot more of that and we just cut that down to like the bare essentials and it's currently like the most the, like the best selling product on flip models so uh, having less text isn't bad and also you need to explain the the product through the gallery images as well ideally like those two work together in a sense 
but really just keeping it simple is the core of making a nice product page. Yeah, I think that's about it for for this series. We've covered a lot of we've covered a lot of different things. These are basically all the steps that we've taken and learned throughout the years in order to create successful tutorials or asset packs, whatever it may be, everything that we sell online on, on flipnormals.com. And, and, you know, if you've missed any of the videos before, there's a playlist where you can check out uh, the other ones in the series. And we hope that this truly helps you make better products that sell more and just, you know, helps you get your info out there to, to everyone that you want to get it out to. And if you're, if you're not currently a creator on Flip Almost and you want to start to sell products there, you can head over to flipmoms.com and you can apply to become a creator and then you can start selling your own products as well. All these videos are also available as articles as well, which you can find on blog.flipmoms.com or just in the video description here. So you can always refer to these later on. So thank you so much for watching and um, hopefully we'll see your products on Flipmoms.